best panel session today. We've got some fun questions for these guys. So um, I'm going to do my best to stay on script just for the first part. Um, usually they don't give me a script uh, when I'm, I'm doing the weather. So, um, <laughs> but I am. Uh, you'll likely most to see me on the weekend evening, so the six six thirty in our eleven o'clock newscast on ABC and NBC here in Jacksonville. So very happy to be a part of this. Um, so today's panel discussions are going to focus on four main themes relating to the overall theme of the State of Reserve, of course, the art of science in our community. So the art of science is intended to explore the ways in which we make decisions as individuals and communities while the science and research to inform those decisions is continually investigated. So the four main things that we're going to ask questions on are the communication to the public, making decisions without firm science, community preparedness and response, and then also storm economic impacts, which we've had a couple of those in the past couple of years, right? Um, so following the sessions, we'll ask questions from folks, and I think even after, maybe a couple questions if people have, um, you know, want to interact with, with us as well. Um, so let's get to know our panelists. This is where the script really comes in handy, because you guys have impressive bios. Um, so Dr. Bill Daly is an Associate Professor of Civil and Coastal, Coastal Engineering at UNF. He's been a coastal engineer for nearly 35 years and specializes in coastal physical processes and engineering. Thanks for being here. Dr. Todd Osborne is an assistant professor of biogeochemistry at the greatest university, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> laboratory focuses on sea level rise, increased hurricane frequency, and rising temperatures on coastal wetland form and function. Then we have Jeffrey Alexander. Hello. He's the Deputy Director of Emergency Management for St. John's County, focusing on serving the community through emergency planning, training, and prevention. And next we have Brian Carter. He's an environmental consultant and the principal of Carter Environmental Services, where his work includes environmental permitting, wetland delineation, protected animal species <coughs> surveys, and so much more. And then last but not least, we have Scott Eastman over there. He is the stewardship coordinator here at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, his team efforts provide stewardship to the vast estuaries and the salt marsh and the mangrove habitats within the reserve, as well as the portion of the marine habitat that falls within the reserve's boundary and the Northeast Florida Aquatic Reserves. All right, so let's get started. Um, this question is interesting um, to me because I find it very interesting. I have a lot of friends that aren't as interested in science as I am, per se. So those of us with scientific educations and backgrounds, we tend to take it for granted that um, everyone thinks scientifically, right? And they're trying to make the best rational decisions based on the data that we have. Now, although there's a large portion of our society that doesn't have a big scientific background. So the big question is how do we educate those people to get them interested in science and to make the best decisions, I guess, for um, society and you know, the decisions for people that are actually making the decisions as well in our, in our governments. <laughs> You know, as, as a scientist and as an educator, probably um, one of the biggest challenges we have is getting, you know, maybe maybe heavy information out to the public so that not only can they make decisions, but that our decision makers, those officials can do it also. It's actually a really big challenge. I mean, part of maybe 25% of my time is spent trying to disseminate information in digestible ways. You know, you have your technical talk and then you have your kind of like, well, broader picture. I think we just saw a really good talk that did that a few minutes ago. I can give props to our plenary speaker because that was a really good example of how to do that, how to translate some highly technical information into digestible stuff um, for others. But it's probably the most challenging part of my job, too. I would say that um, because there's so much, uh, as a scientist, you, you kind of try to be really uh, objective. And then there's subjectivity when you get to topics that are, can be emotional or charged in public. So that's probably um, 
I would say that the, the part that I'm least comfortable with, um, trying to remain subjective or, or objective in those kind of scenarios. So that's a that's a probably a, a big place of friction between the science community and the public. Mm -hmm. People thinking that maybe science is being used to advance a political agenda rather Absolutely. than just looking at the data. Does anyone else have anything? I'll add a little bit. I think some of it's also visual. So, you know, for one thing, seeing the environments, like the presentations and the videos that Jeremy was showing as well, but also kind of the behind the scenes, letting them know that these scientists are people, like seeing them out in the field. So, short videos, short images, those types of things I think are really beneficial. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, obviously, it starts with the youth, with education, uh, to, so that they understand uh, basic science, so that when they see a uh, visual, like, He's just describing how I many pictures worth a thousand words, and they see a quick visual, they can comprehend it. Cool. And from our perspective, our biggest concern is <coughs> teaching people what a reliable source is. Um, it's the biggest joke in the world. I read it on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> uh, we work with public safety. We use science to determine when people are in danger, and they use the internet to make the argument that they're not. Um, and that's really not healthy. Um, so our concerns are mostly focused on trying to get people to understand you have to use a reliable source. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. And we actually have evidence of people who go out there to try to fool people. They make data and information, it looks like it comes from the news station or the weather service, trying to make it look authentic to, to, to say things that are actually opposite of what we say. So finding a good reliable source is what and direct people to because we believe people can make the decisions if they're properly educated. I, uh, I'm an engineer uh, as, as well as a scientist and um, I used to live in Melbourne Beach, I lived there for 15 years um, and the people who would come and buy beachfront uh, were often totally ignorant of what they were getting into. And I almost have this fantasy that in order to buy a beachfront property, you have to pass a test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have to read a brochure, to operate a boat, you gotta go online and take the online course and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, just to sit and and understand uh, the specifics of the property what, that you're considering buying uh, is a big issue. Some properties are quite safe. The house is well back from the primary dune. You've got three dunes in front of you, you're pretty safe. Then you're uh, in uh, South Bonavita Beach or Milano Beach and you're butt up against day 1A and uh, trying to put in a seawall that doesn't last through the first hurricane that hits it. Um, and uh, that really is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, it, and that's when you get people upset. Uh, yeah, my house is going to fall in the water. You need to build me a beach nourishment project. And uh, that's not, you know, that's not Joe Blow's responsibility who lives uh, 20 miles in that. So uh, I really, <laughs> I really, and tongue in cheek, but I think uh, you really need to educate any person who need who wants to build beachfront, who wants to live beachfront. And they're surprised when their house is falling in the ocean, right? Um, well, so speaking of some of these recent storm events, um, like Matthew, like Irma, um, there's a lot of different moving parts city, county, academia, agencies. Um, and then the community, what have they done well with these recent events and what do you think still needs a little more help? And there's, I know there's a whole lot to this, um, but then, you know, what do we need to, I guess, address for future risks? I think one of the most important things, some of the most important things. Um, we're beginning to learn in coastal engineering uh, with our beach nourishment projects. Um, I was I was shocked when I first moved here to Jacksonville and saw what Jacksonville Beach looked like back in the 1970s. They were throwing uh, washing machines and old cars in front of their houses trying to protect them. And 
Jacksonville Beach is now a completely man-made beach. And we nourish it every year, every, year, every, year, uh, every uh, six or seven years or so. And uh, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, it went from so Jacksonville Beach didn't have dunes basically, and right. now it's all man-made. They were re-nourishing yeah. it every few years. Okay, thank you. So what we've learned is uh, the typical beach design maybe 10 years ago was to have a very wide berm where everyone could lay out their towel and lots of people could congregate. And the dune wasn't such a big player. And now, especially after uh, Sandy and, uh, and uh, Irma and uh, Matthew, and the uh, 04 hurricane season, which uh, um, still affects my life uh, financially. Um, they're beginning to put sand more emphasis on building the dune as opposed to building a berm. Uh, because the, the dune is much better at holding the water back than, than the lower berm. So that's one thing that we've learned Say that I think um, since since these two storms have hit our community here, we have two two really important things have happened. One, the the interest from the public perspective has gone way up, mm -hmm. right? So we've had a taste of it, right? I'm talking about climate change and sea level rise and all of these issues that seem to be kind of politicized in our in our mainstream media. But now our local community is is very engaged in that, and that's good. Um, which means now, as scientists, we have an opportunity to do that educating, but also for people to make choices about, well, do we want to learn about that? Do we want to research that and study it, or do we want to respond quickly? Um, looking back at, at the historic responses we've had in the past, learning from that is a real big uh, issue, too. And so I think, although there's been a lot of negativity associated with those two storms that hit our, our local area, um, as Matthew and Irma, I think we've had an opportunity to do this kind of thing, you know, in a, in a very open way of, of looking for reliable information and ways to figure out um, better solutions to the problems we have. So I'd say that's a plus. There's been a lot of negative, too. Um, I, do, I think social media has a big thing to do with what you're talking about, too. It's just people are so engaged in it, and images, again, visual. Um, pictures speak a thousand words, and just be, people being able to see what's actually happening with these storms, why it's affected. Um, we have the issue uh, with forecasting, um, not to call them out back there, but Richard Nunn. <laughs> okay. um, I think that uh, the problem is, or Mark, excuse me, Mark calls over there, hey. <laughs> we have an issue in broadcast especially, is that it's not affecting my house, it's not a big deal. Um, but with Matthew and Irma, there's so much more conversation that people are realizing these are big, massive storms, not just the severe thunderstorm over their house. So, anything to add that we could do better? Well, I can certainly, there's just several things to talk about. The, the question leads directly into the first question or follows from it very nicely. Uh, the understanding that the storms that we just experienced didn't hit us. Okay. Yeah, um, right. So many people believe, well, we've been hit by a hurricane and all I have to do is put a little more sand in front of my house. I'll, I'll be good. Yeah. No, you, it missed you. And you got a little taste of what it could do. And you could see how much it pulled away from our coastline, how many trees and buildings it knocked down, how much sand we lost. When we really hit, it would be 10 times more of that. And people have a hard time visualizing that. They don't, I mean, even someone who's studied it for 30 years, it's hard to visualize. What happens if we lose 10 times what we lost? So someone who is trying to build their life back deals with what they can see. And uh, convincing them that that what we saw this morning, this is a global thing. What you're doing right here doesn't affect what's happening globally. And you can be wasting your time, <coughs> energy, and money to try and do what you think is going to help. These things happen over 
hundreds and thousands of years. You can build on the coast now, you can have a house for the next 50 years, 51 years from now, you need to rethink that. Do you need to move the house, abandon it, reinforce it? But you can't expect these things to last forever. And what we do now, and how we educate the population, on um, where are you safe? I always come back to where are you safe, it's kind of what I do. Um, <laughs> where are you safe? Where can you live safely? And if it's no longer safe, it's really not a good idea. I mean, we, we can replace everything. We can replace sand, we can replace houses, cars, possessions, but we only have one of you, and we want to keep that. So as long as we can. So we have to keep people safe, and understanding where the safety line can be drawn is important for everybody. And they look at what they've learned, and the government, the news media, and the community aren't helping by saying, yeah, when we were hit by Matthew, we weren't. When we were hit by Irma, we weren't. It gives people this false understanding. When we had the impacts from Matthew, when we had the impacts from Irma, which could have been worse. Is it better terminology? Is it easier to say no? Is it, is it more accurate? Yes. But how do we teach that and get a vernacular going with the community so that they're all moving in the right direction? Great. Yeah, I, I, after Matthew, I got sucked into a lot of beach, a lot of homeowners along Ponte Vedra and Volano Beach that wanted what we all want. We all want, you know, the question is always, how much does it cost and how long does it take? <laughs> That's what I deal with all the time because I work on behalf of a lot of private property owners. Um, in this instance, going to what these other gentlemen have said, it, it's not a matter of money, and it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of uh, that they shouldn't be there. It's not a safe place. So when you, if you're willing to understand that, and if you're willing to live in the risk, then that's one thing. Um, but part of the other problem was going back to what Dr. Zidali. Uh, they should have a, for, you know, a, a some sort of test that they fill out if they want to live <laughs> in an unsafe environment. No, I mean, we laugh. But if they live in an unsafe, if, if, you, if you deem that the counties deem that unsafe, based on engineering and, and scientific <laughs> research, then they should have a form that they fill out that, that it no longer becomes the burden of the guy that lives 20 miles yeah. inland to pay. People genuinely thought that they really, really did. Um, that it was everybody's burden. And so, obviously, as a community, it, it's important that we recognize where those unsafe areas are and that we. Um, uh, try to get the word out that they are unsafe areas and then that liability needs to be understood. It's like when you're signing a form to go on a roller coaster or something. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I know my risks. Something you just said made me think, you know, maybe, maybe we should be leasing beachfront property for 50 years. After 50 years, we'll decide whether you can still live there or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think Hawaii would do something similar to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm thinking, just from this conversation, this is good. I think a negative that we're doing is still kind of looking at this reactively. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us in this room and as well in this panel kind of knew this has been a long-term problem. Mm -hmm. uh, beaches have been eroding. We know we're critically eroded. It was just these storms that were kind of that tipping point. Uh, so we haven't been looking at this as kind of the, the long shot of where this is coming. Um, so I think we need to address that more in this, the time series. And like we said, that's hard to do because we weren't really hit, right? Um, so I guess then talking, keeping the combo going with these storms to move forward, do you guys see any changes in the way that communities are being built? I mean, for example, driving down A1A, um, seeing what's happening to the homes that are being rebuilt or sold or, you know, you name it. Um, what can we do then to make our communities more sustainable and stronger? I think we've touched on it a little, but... Yeah, I shake my head. Simple <laughs> things. Uh, the long, the long story. After Matthew, uh, we took all of our graduate students and created a special topics course where we studied uh, Matthew in three components. One was we had one group modeling Matthew uh, with the best numerical models that we had available. Uh, we had another 
another group that inspected the uh, beachfront properties and identifies specific ones to focus in on uh, and how they uh, were hit and then how the owner was trying to recover. And we had a third group who handled the docks back in uh, the St. John's River. Um, and uh, <coughs> the, there were already people in trouble. In fact, the uh, parents of one of my graduate students owned the beachfront in uh, North Alano Beach. And uh, they were, they knew they were in trouble and they were trying to get a permit to build a seawall from DEP before Matthew came along and they were denied. And uh, Matthew hit and they were allowed to build a seawall. And the seawall they had built was uh, plastic. Plastic was not meant to take waves. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the National Science Foundation, after Matthew asked a bunch of us, that we, some of them came, scientists came from Maine to, to survey the beach. And uh, I was just appalled as an engineer as to how badly these, sea, these plastic seawalls had uh, performed during, uh, during the storm. And, uh, you know, it's a waste of money, a waste of emotion. And uh, you know, one of these uh, people who built these plastic seawalls were the parents of my graduate student. And I, I happened to run into him. He was out inspecting his property or what was left of it after the storm when we came walking down the beach. Embarrassed as an engineer that such a thing got uh, perfect. But that's what happened. Repeatedly. It's all a uh, knee jerk reaction to the trouble on him. Um, after the 04 hurricanes, you know, I was very busy in Brevard County. Um, and uh, you know, people were just scurrying. How do we get a beach nourishment project? Well, it takes, in average, it takes eight years to get a beach nursery project built. So it's not going to happen fast. I'd like to say one thing about responsibility. And when we're talking about this, I think um, as an information provider, my, my role is to provide information, right? The scientifically rigorous information so we can make decisions. That being said, I have a lot of sympathy for folks that are in that situation. I mean, it's a tremendous one, right? A financial situation, uh, a life-changing event. But we know how barrier islands work, how coastlines work. Um, and I'll use an example that's not so far from that, is wildfire. You, know, you see the, the fire problems out west, right? Um, there's fire, there's fuel management problems, and there's also homeowners that don't take the or don't heed the advice given about safety clearance of vegetation around their houses, maintaining that fuel load, things like that. And so I look at them kind of parallel as if the information is there. We, we, we have some understanding, yet we have this kind of um, self-enforced neglect that occurs where we say, okay, well, you know, yeah, hurricane's coming or, or our storm um, has a potential to wreck our, our oceanfront property. We're going to do any of that. And so I think part of the conversation we need to have is that you know, there's responsibility of the individual property owner to <coughs> take that burden upon themselves and, and do the best they can given the information we have. So. Uh, I think it was pretty clear this morning. Uh, the doctor indicated, why do people live at the beach? Because it's beautiful. <laughs> I live 7.136 miles from the beach. <laughs> Because that's as close as I can live to the beach and still feel as though if I'm not home during a hurricane, my family's safe. But I still live seven miles from the coast. A hurricane is 30 miles wide. Seven miles means nothing. To the so we have to change something that's almost impossible to change. It takes hundreds of years to change. And that is 
our concept that I'm going to hand my house down to my kids so that they can later and hand it down to their kids. Some of where we live is white bread. I buy a loaf of white bread every couple of days because I really like white bread sandwiches. But eventually, I have to give up that loaf of bread because it doesn't have preservatives in it and it goes bad. I have to throw it away and get a new one. And our homes are not going to last for hundreds of years. The water's not going away from the home, it's coming towards it. Uh, the, the world around us is changing. We have to accept, our society has to learn that our community, as we envision it, is in a change, state of change. And we have to allow that change to happen. Again, you can build on the coast, but accept that that home may not be here 50 years from now. You can build seven miles from the coast and accept that 100 years from now, your great grandkids may not be able to live there. But the problem is, how do you change a mentality of an entire community into an understanding without oversimplifying? Because, you can't, because when you oversimplify, it becomes a trendy thing that's great for a short period of time and dies off. It has to become part of our culture to understand some things are fleeting. And fleeting in terms of the community can be 50, 100, 150, 200 years. Long after we're gone, our great, great grandchildren will be seeing what we think they'll be seeing, but we don't even know that. So it's, it's that social consciousness of the community. A community develops a sense of place. This is what our community is, and they don't like it to change. That's why we put the sand back on the beach. We spent eight years trying to find the funding, moving the sand up there, and then one storm comes by and takes it all away. Because we want our community to stay the same. And I'm sure some anthropologist out there has probably figured out why we want our community to stay the same. <laughs> I know in the 600s, the community would build where it could build, and then when the environment got nasty, they moved it over here. So somewhere in the last 1,200 years, we've become less mobile. And we want our society to stay where it is. We've got to get a little bit of what we used to be back, and understanding we can't always just stay and it can't stay the same. I'd like to comment on that because I think that's a really good point. You know, even less than a hundred years ago, there wasn't a lot of development on the coastline. You know, I was reading this, this interesting book about Matanzas Inlet or about the, the Summer Haven community down there. Um, and people would build little fish shacks on the inside of the river and go there for the weekend or just to escape and then leave because they, they recognize that at, you know, any given day a storm come along and take that away. And that was that way for a long time. Even when, when St. Augustine was, was developed as a city, for hundreds of years, people would go across the river and walk over to the beach for the day and come back. Um, I, I read a really great book about uh, Melbourne Beach. You know, uh, Along the, the I-95 corridor was um, a, you know, an access up and down the East Coast, and then little towns would, would pop up on the, on the west side of the Indian River Lagoon. But there wasn't really any development on the barrier line because it was too risky. I mean, you know, no one would go out there and build a house and try to live there and then lose their house and, and be, you know, homeless. So that that's kind of a new construct for us, and, and we don't, yeah, we don't see a, an easy path to reverse that <coughs> process, right? Right. Well, if you ask me, nobody should live within five miles of the coast. If I had to convince everybody who lived, had to evacuate, that was within five miles of the coast. But seventy percent of our population in Florida lives within ten miles of the coast. Right. There's a reason for that. We want to live near the coast. Um, I had a point I was going to make, but I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you, laughed, you laughed at my joke. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to jump in on, on the permitting regulation side, because that's what I deal with 65 hours a week. Um, uh, so on the permitting the seawalls, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, we all recognize that there's a political climate and then there's a regulatory climate. And many times, those X, Y axes, they inter 
you know, they, they intersect. And so in the, in the seawall issue, what's behind, a, and let's talk regionally where we are right here, what's behind those houses that are A1A? And so you, when, when DOT is the Florida Department of Transportation and DEP is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, um, you know, they're all in this capital, Tallahassee, and they're talking. Hey, let those people spend the money and buy us time because the next one that's coming is, is A1A and then we're going to have to deal with it. So there's obviously the polit on the permitting side, there's the political and, and, regu and regulatory climate. Um, there's one of the, some other things that we're doing. Um, regular, it's interesting, after, is there a knee-jerk reaction? Sure, there's a knee-jerk reaction. We're seeing it as we drive you know, here today. Um, but things that the regulations don't have that same kind of knee-jerk reaction as maybe, and, and maybe they shouldn't, but a perfect example is um, dock, uh, intercoastal docks or you know, river docks. I do a lot of dock permitting. The regulations are five feet above mean high water. Um, about three or four years ago, through listening and, and studying about sea uh, climate uh, change and sea level rise, I was thinking well, five feet's not enough. There's a huge var tidal variance. I mean, I see it. I go out the, I'm out that river at least every weekend, and I, I and I live within seven houses of the marsh, um, <laughs> not, on the, not on the ocean side, but on the downtown St. Augustine side. And I, mean, we, and I see, and, and I see, I see the tide, and I've lived there for 17 years, and I've seen the tide come way up more than it ever has back in our streets. So I, I started telling our clients, look, build six to seven feet above mean high water for your docks. The docks that were built over the last few years that we did that on, they were fine during Irma and Matthew. Most of the other docks were trash. Um, and, and of course, for docks, for those of you who don't know, docks is... Uh, it, it's 10% of the cost of the dock annually to insure. So most people don't insure them. They just, they, they have to pay to rebuild them. And they're expensive. I mean, they're 80 grand, 120 grand. So, you know, that's one of the things. Um, obviously, we've seen a lot of conversation from FEMA on finished floor elevations of homes. Um, a lot of damage that was done was obviously below the, the nine. People will say, you know, in short conversation, oh, my, I'm, at, I'm at nine or I'm at 10, so I'm good. Um, right? Can you hear that? Right. So um, the theme is talking about going to 10. I don't know if that happened yet. That was supposed to happen. Hasn't happened yet. It was, I was heard it was supposed to happen in February. Um, the other issue in regulation is, you know, stormwater ponds for rainwater versus tidally influenced water. It's a big difference. Um, tidally influenced water can't be handled with a pond, so to speak. It's coming in over top and flooding in, and we've, we've all seen that. Uh, but that, th there, there's been a lot of attention to that in the regulatory permitting side and the civil engineering side, um, and how to deal with that. Well, typically how to deal with it is, okay, so finished floor on FEMA is a nine, well, let's make it 11. Well, there's, there's imp major implications to that because there's affordability issues. I mean, you start putting sand on these barrier islands that are at four feet, and you're bringing it up to nine or 10, I mean, my house is built in 1947. It's on four-foot piers, concrete piers, over grade, and more efficient. And I, I, I didn't flood during River Matthew, but it could, you know, get underneath if it if it had to. Um, that's all I wanted to mention. All right. Um, <laughs> wow. I kind of want to, you know, summarize, and it's kind of this 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 balance. It is challenging because I look at the panel, and it really does look like the elephant in the room is we're thinking about coastal retreat as an only option. And we know that in time it may be. Uh, but I'll try to add some positivity as well, too. Uh, as we're talking with Todd, a lot of this is buying time. Uh, it's buying sand. It's buying plants. It's having native plantings in areas that can actually recruit. Uh, Jeremy, in his talk, was talking about these sand sources that may be in the near shore environment. So it's as simple as trying to get some of that to naturally displace in these areas rather than having them locked up within these barriers. Uh, but again, I think, you know, as we mentioned that with Alana, it's buying time, so eventually we will be looking at this. So then that's our next question. <laughs> let's just raise our Seven. hands. Yes or no, let's make it interactive here. Should people leave coastal areas and live elsewhere? Yes or no? It's not an easy answer. <laughs> All right, explain oh. yourselves. <laughs> no. 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 Um, yeah, I advocate retreat. But I, re I advocate retreat over the next 50, 100, 200 years. And I, I remember my point from earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you 
If, if it ever was up to me from a public safety standpoint, nobody would live within five miles of yours. From a developer standpoint, from an economic standpoint, everybody wants to live within five miles of the coast. And let's face it, my favorite quote of all time, J.P. Morgan, it's about the money, stupid. <laughs> what generates money? Building on the coast, paying taxes from the coast, visiting the coast. That builds that society that we like. We, we do love community. That's why we all live, huddle together in cities and, and in counties and government. So, no, we shouldn't retreat from the coast, but we should be realistic about how long the coast will be where it is and understand that because there's a pressure to build out there, but there's an, a world that's, they taught me in sixth grade earth science, the job of the ocean is to make the world flat and the job of the mountains is to build it back up. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're up there by the coast, the world is trying to make your house flat. So we have to understand that. And, you know, everything I've learned, I learned in elementary school. <laughs> um, so we have to find that balance. It's all about finding that balance and developing a community thought process that's not, okay, everything along the coast was destroyed. And, and I love this one. I see it all the time. We have to help those people get their lives back the way they were. No. <laughs> That's not going to help. We have to build it back so that it will last the next 50 years. And what does that mean? That means some people aren't going to get their houses back. Why? Because their land is in the ocean now. And you can't build on the ocean. Well, you can, but it really costs a lot of money. <laughs> getting sewer out there is just so complicated. So, the idea is we have to help build the community back better, not help those poor, those poor people get their houses back and their lives back the way they were. Now, please don't make believe that I believe that we shouldn't help people. It's kind of what I do. My job is to help people. But I'm not helping them if I'm putting them back in danger and putting them in a situation where they're going to lose even more next time. Because if you're still paying off this storm, when the next storm hits and tears your house down again, now you've been over three houses and you have none. So I'm not helping you. Helping you is, is helping you to realize the best thing for you to do is build in a better, safer place. And that might mean on the other side of the road. And if we can build a society to understand that, because my heart bleeds for everybody, too. I donate money to those causes. Every time somebody has a disaster, we've got to help those people get their lives back. It's just how do you define back? And, that, and as a society, it means get you back to where you were. And we need to change that to get you back to a better place. A little bit. I think this brings us back to Bill's original statement with education. Yes. Because I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I live less than a quarter mile from the coast. <laughs> <laughs> Why I moved here. <laughs> so, so, I don't so, believe you should move away. Yeah. I will eventually. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of it is knowing. It's like you said, it's this education of knowing what's going on, knowing what our surroundings are, knowing these long term trends. Because, like I said, we can say it's hurricanes, but this is long term. And we're going to see what's going to happen in, like you said, 50 years, 100 years. We'll have a totally different landscape here, I'm sure. Right. Back to the questionnaire. So it's living on the coast. Sounds like you've taken your stuff. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything to add? Should people uh, move off the coast? I, I did a lot of uh, work in uh, coastal Mississippi after Katrina.
lot of those sites were simply 10 foot all, 10 foot high sticks. Uh, and of all the, most of the hundreds of houses that I looked in around, I saw three that actually changed, increased the length of their sticks. insurance, they'll pay for, you know, I've been paying big bucks for this insurance and they'll pay for me to rebuild. Um, so some of the some of the pressure has to come from the insurance industry as well. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna insure you to build your house back where it is in North Carolina Beach. Um, and it's unfortunate I mean, I'll, I'll add. I mean, we all know that it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And we had two wins in the last two years. Um, and that one being the direct win. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 educating people on where they're, they're the most vulnerable. And if they're, as a community, do we, I, I have written this and I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to say it now. Um, I, I think, you know, Future gener the resources that we're spending on hardening surfaces, hardening edges, um, to put people back to, to resume life as, as it was, uh, future generations are going to laugh at us. I mean, it's going it, to, it doesn't make sense. We have to change, Dr. Stalker, what he was saying, we have to change. We're in the middle of the stasis. You know, nothing stays the same. That's the only constant has changed. So um, we have to change. Our communities have to evolve. And... It's not just rebuilding back to the way it was. I mean, I'm not saying people necessarily need to move, but I, my finished floor is at 11, and I'm genuinely contemplating lifting my house up. And I'm on the top of what I call Fullerwood Hill, where I live in my neighborhood, and I'm contemplating it. Because what's going to happen is when, I mean, if I do it, people around my neighborhood, because they know what I do, and they'll be like, you're at the top of the hill. I'm like, yeah, I bought on the top of the hill for a reason, and I didn't. <laughs> um, and people always say that, you know, oh, you're in that neighborhood, oh, gosh, they, they flooded really bad. And I say, oh, I didn't flood. Well, I, you know, wow, that's awesome. You lucked out. I'm like, well, I'm kind of, I, I'm a nerd about this stuff. I'm like, I'm the top of the hill. <laughs> but, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if, someone, if you said, okay, yeah, you, you could stay, and yeah, we'll insure you, but we want your finished floor at 14, you know, and that if they were willing to do that because the next one comes and it flooded underneath, then I think that's fine to say. I don't have a problem with it. If we, if we can we engineer, engineer ourselves out of all of it? No. But um, can we make modifications to structures to allow us to stay there? You know, and when the when happens, then we would be better prepared. <laughs>